All right. I think we have folks that are um, joining us now on Zoom. So I want to say hello to Alan, Dina, Miss Mays, Love, all the other folks joining us on Zoom. I know I have folks joining us on Facebook Live. I want to say welcome, everyone, to the Menu Install Design Workshop for Transform Lexington Market. My name is Pickett Slater Harrington, and I'm here with my colleague Peter tonight, and we're going to tell you everything that you need to know to kind of create a really spectacular menu um, to be a vendor in Lexington Market, as well as talk about the stall design of the space that um, you could potentially be serving as a vendor in for Lexington Market. Peter, if you can put up our first slide for us tonight, which is just introductions. And once again, I'm Pickett Slater Harrington. I serve as the community engagement lead at Seawall. And Seawall is the developer chosen by the city of Baltimore to facilitate the transformation of Lexington Market. Seawall believes in using real estate to connect communities and launch powerful ideas. I'm joined tonight um, by my colleague, Peter. Peter, if you can introduce yourself. Again, thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm with Seawall as well. I'm the food and beverage lead at Seawall and for this project. So I live and breathe, breathe everything related to the vendors and the food and beverage um, folks within this project um, and more broadly at Seawall and the other markets that we've uh, designed and developed. Thanks a lot, Peter. If you can go to the next slide, I want to give folks an overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, we'll share a little bit um, about the project um, for uh, Lexington Market. I want to encourage everyone to go to transformlexington.com. Peter, if you can drop that into the chat box um, if you're in um, Zoom and also into the comment box if you're on Facebook Live. We'll share a little bit, but you can go there to find out all the information about the project, how to connect to the um, vendor application, and we also have their recorded and informa inform information session. So if you check out the info session that's listed under the support and resources section on the website, you can find out more in detail about that. After we give a little bit of project overview, we're really going to dive into the menu design, talking specifically about how do you create menus for public markets. And then the last section that we'll talk about tonight is designing a stall. What will the stall look, look like? What do they come with? All the information that you want to know about stall design and Lexington Market. Uh, Peter, if you can go to the next slide. Um, I tell people quickly that um, Lexington Market is Baltimore's market and it's going through a transformation and a renovation. And we're so excited about it. If you go to transformlexington.com, you can see a time-lapse photo of the construction of the new building. You can find out all the information um, about the renovation and see different renderings. What you see in front of you now is um, a inside view of the market. The market will be two levels, so two floors, an upper floor and a lower floor. And what you have here um, in the bottom picture is this grand staircase. We're calling it Baltimore's largest stoop. So this will connect the uh, upper and lower floors. And you also see a picture here um, that shows you kind of how things will look inside the market. You have an example of a stall here, um, some menus there, some product, people moving around. Um, it gives you a feel and a sense of the market. Uh, in the previous slide, we showed you the design of the market kind of harkens back to this old shed design uh, from previous years and iterations of the market. So it's gonna cover a lot of great things here, a lot of energy. Um, in this space. Next slide, Peter. I wanted to highlight the different categories of food that will exist in Lexington Market. So first is your fresh food. So those items you can get in a grocery store, and they range from um, produce to, to meat to fish to dry goods. Um, ultimately, Lexington Market is about food access, and it's about fresh food as well. There'll also be uh, prepared food, so food that's consumed there on site. So you're going to have, um, you know, vendor categories that folks are going to be cooking there. So you're going to have stalls with cooking hoods, quick service, counter service restaurant. All of that is going to be part of Lexington Market. It's, it's historically been a part of the market. It will continue to be part of the market. 
And then we have a category that we're calling specialty food and retail. So this could cover anything from fresh flowers to candies to breads to nuts to spices. So lots of different um, opportunities for lots of different vendors to connect with customers in Lexington Market. So those first three, fresh food, prepared food, and specialty food and retail are what we call our permanent stalls or stalls that will, will kind of be there uh, with the same vendor day in, day out throughout um, the year. But we also have kiosk spaces. So kiosk spaces are kind of short-term and medium-term rentals. Um, this could be for makers, for retail, for other types of specialty food businesses who don't need the space of a uh, large permanent stall, but they want to connect with customer, customers. So all this works together to create a mix of different categories of food. Uh, Peter, next slide. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to show you the layout of the market. Um, Peter will get more into this as we talk about the stall design. But if you see over to um, the, the side of the, um, the screen, the different categories. So yellow represents fresh food, red um, specialty food and retail, and green prepared food. And then this darker kind of orange is, is um, kiosk. And what you're looking at is the upper floor, so the top floor. So you see a concentration of specialty food kind of in the middle. Uh, and you see the prepared food around on the outside, right? And those are the stalls with hoods that are going to be cooking um, on food and just preparing food on the outside and inside specialty retail. You have the orange kiosk scattered throughout. And if you look um, at the far end of the floor layout, you'll see a community room. So this is a room that's going to be open um, to community. It can be seating for eating or it can be used for private or public events. So pretty good size space there to connect with community. Um, you also um, can see here a little bit of where loading and trash goes to on the outside as well. That's going to be its own side street. So you don't have to worry about trucks kind of blocking away. Um, if you have a personal vehicle, you can pull in there, um, unload or get deliveries there and have trash taken out and then not interfere with the front of the street. Next slide, Peter. So this next slide gives a layout of the lower floor. And once again, I want to point out the kind of food categories and colors. And so you see the um, fresh food um, is really predominantly here on the first floor. So when you walk into the market, right, you get that fresh produce, you get your meats, you get your kind of dry goods here. And we do have some specialty food and retail mixed in uh, along with um, some prepared as well. So a, a little mixture here, but predominantly fresh food on the first floor. If you look, there are tons of storage, you know, for both the, um, you know, the lower floor and upper floor. So you have um, storage facilities there, dry and cold storage in both. Peter, next slide. Thank you, Pickett. Um, and uh, thanks for the kind of introduction orientation of the, of, of the market. Um, like Pickett mentioned, on the website, we have kind of an extended version of the info session where we go into the application, how to apply, um, and some more details on that. But, but that's not what we're going to focus on tonight. Um, we're going to focus first on the menu design uh, for a public market, on your concept, how you think about that. And second, on what you put in the stall, how you, how you design the inside of the stall, what the process looks like for this market. Now, of course, we're going to talk about Lexington Market a lot tonight, but these are good principles of how you might design a menu or you might design a physical space, a kitchen stall um, for anywhere that you might go. Um, and feel free to enter questions in the chat in the Q&A um, as we go, we're happy to answer them um, as we go, pick it. I know you'll help me out um, reading them and, and, and let me know as we roll through these slides. So let's jump in. Um, first of all, uh, you might hear a lot about a concept, like what is the concept of your, of your restaurant, of your place, right? And there's kind of three important questions here, right? One is, what is what's your story? You know, why is it that you're passionate about doing what you want to do? Maybe it's that you want to bring some family recipes or something from your heritage uh, into, a, into a, a restaurant or share it with others. Maybe it's you want to make something um, with local goods, you want to, uh, with organic goods, or you want to do something a little bit more healthy than it's been done in the past. Those might be uh, things that drive the way that you design this stall. Um, maybe it's based on a cuisine or a region of the world. 
um, you know, the, the, the more personal your concept is, the more it's going to, the more it resonates with you, the more it's going to resonate with customers. So don't hesitate to, 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 to jump into those personal stories and to, to pull out those details that matter to you, right? Um, two uh, is thinking a little bit of like, but how do I do it in a way that will work in a market, right? Like what's different about a market than if I'm just opening a restaurant or opening a store somewhere? Well, there's three things that we think are, uh, that, that kind of separate it. One is a small size, right? You're not dealing with a huge kitchen, which means you have to think through how the people will work in that kitchen, how you will, the food will work, um, how you can get things out quickly. Um, and, um, you know, kind of work in those small confines, right? You maybe not have a 30 item menu, maybe you have a 10 item menu. The second is this is shared space. Now this actually makes it much easier, right? If you're running a whole restaurant, you gotta, you gotta need to deal with chairs and tables and servers, um, you know, sign a lease for a whole building or space, perhaps deal with maintenance and trash and all these contracts in a shared space like Lexington Market, you know, that takes a few things off of your plate, right? It means that you can focus on really just making and cooking delicious food and you don't have to think about trash. You don't have to think about pest control. You don't have to think about chairs and tables. So it's shared. Um, and it, it means there's other folks coming through the market, right? It means that you have a limited amount of time to grab customers' attention. If, you're, if you think about walking through Lexington Market or our house or Belvedere Square Market or Cross Street Market Northeast, um, how long do you spend waiting in front of a stall thinking, should I eat there? Probably not much, like three seconds, right? You're walking and you look at the menu, you look at the food that you can see and you make a decision and then you move to the next, right? And that's how customers work. It's very, it's a quick a place uh, because it's a shared environment, right? And it's a fast pace in terms of the food that you serve, right? Customers don't wanna wait 10 or 15 minutes sitting at a table, right? For the food, they want that food in less than five minutes, two to five minutes. That's the magic number, right? Uh, you can't design a menu item that takes 10 or 12 minutes. It's just not gonna work in a market. It might work in a restaurant. It's not gonna work in Lexington market. Um, so those are the three keys to, to make what makes a market vendor. And the third is kind of how to organize your menu, right? We always encourage people to think about whether you're, in, you're organizing it around a cuisine or a format. So I'll give you an example of that, right? Uh, if you are a sandwich shop, and we're going to use an example of a sandwich shop. Pickett yesterday called it Acme Sandwich. So that's what it is. Um, you've got a sandwich. Not very advertising, but it, it yeah, will go with it. No, look, we, it's, not, it's, it's not about branding here. It's all about the sandwiches. So <laughs> um, that's a sandwich shop is organized around the format of the sandwiches, right? We're going to be a Baltimore sandwich shop. So we're going to have crab cake sandwich. We're going to have a pit beef sandwich. We're going to have a roast turkey sandwich. Um, and that is going to be organized around format. But you could also have it organized around, or excuse me, organized around cuisine, right? You might be a soul food stall, and you might have lots of classic items from soul food there, but they're not all in the same format because one is roast beef, another is mac and cheese sides, um, fried chicken. Those are all like a little bit different, and there's but they might be served together or separate, right? So one would be organizing around a cuisine, the other would be organizing around a format. Something to keep in mind. Peter, I wanted to share a tip for the folks who are, are listening when it comes to your application. All our applications are read by community reviewers, right? We have a whole team of like 30, 40 community reviewers. These are real people from Baltimore who eat at restaurants who like, you know, um, some are experts in the field, some are not. They just like good food. And so they read your application and there is a category on the application called concept where you have to write down your concept. So it's really important that you have a clear concept. So when the community reviewers read it, they're like, yes, I get it. I know what this place is. I know what they, 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 they're they selling and it sounds delicious. I wanna go get that. So a, a good pressure test is once you write your concept, give it to somebody that you don't know and let them read it. It's like, hey, do you know, like, could you tell me what you think this place sells and, and, and does it resonate with you? And if, if the average person can't quite figure it out or it's too complex, you're gonna to need to go back and touch on those three things that Peter said. So that's gonna be really important. Real people are reading this and they're the ones that's gonna judge, like I get this concept, I understand it. Right, that they understand it, they understand it quickly and that it can be executed within this market. 
But pick it, that's a perfect segue, right? Giving it to somebody to take a look at because who are those people that might take a look at it? Your family and friends, right? They are potential customers, right? And you have to design your menu for customers. You gotta think about the position that they're in when they come up to your stall, right? They could be, you know, we listed some here, families and children, business people on a lunch break, right? They might have a short time that they can come. Um, seniors, maybe they have more time, but they're a little bit more budget constrained, right? Or you have students budget constrained, but maybe they think about it in a little different way. They're looking for things that are new and trendy, right? Um, tourists, locals, like everybody thinks about the, the, the experience at the restaurant in a different way. So as you're putting these menu items together, you can think about who, who am I really targeting and what do those folks value, right? We put some examples here, right? affordability versus the celebration, right? If you're, um, if you're looking for something that's affordable, you might be looking to the, what part of the menu is like gonna be under six bucks, right? Like that's what I got to spend versus some celebrations that, you know what? I'm, I wanna know what, what is it, a crab cake? What is it, you know, I'm, I'm down to um, spend a little bit more here. Maybe it's more, you know, in the evening, maybe those are on the folks that come on the weekends. Um, and so they're thinking about the pricing differently, right? speed versus customization. Well, I want all the options in the world, but can you provide all the options in the world and still get it to me in under five minutes? I don't know. So you got to balance those in your menu items. And traditional versus modern, right? Um, you can say, well, I am the really traditional um, Caribbean food restaurant versus I'm going to do it a different style. I'm going to do it Chipotle style and serve it where you get to pick your rice and pick your meat and pick your vegetables, right? Um, it might be taking something traditional and doing it in a more modern style. So those are things to think about too when you're when you're designing this menu for customers. Who am I targeting and what are they looking for? Quick tip on the application, it asks you to identify two target customers and how you plan on reaching them. So if in the application, we're gonna ask you this question. So think about it and be able to list two target audience you think will be attracted and how you think you're gonna reach them. Absolutely. Um, and here's something we'll touch on here too. I, I mentioned earlier, right, that Chipotle style, it's like, what style is your menu, right? You have a more traditional style of menu, which would be to have a list of items. And, you know, we really encourage you not to keep make this item, this list too long, right? A lot of people think that more items is going to sell more food. That's actually wrong in a market. In fact, it's 100% the opposite. A shorter menu is actually going to get people more focused on the best things that you have you're gonna be able to um, source your ingredients more easily, fewer ingredients. You're gonna have less labor to make those, those products and they're gonna come out better and quicker as a result of not having to make 20 other items in your stall. So list of items is kind of one way to go, right? If you walk into a Panera or a McDonald's, right? It's like, there's a set uh, list of items and there's not a ton, right? You go and make that, it's like, there's one through 10, right? It's not like one through 30. And there's a reason for that. Um, Another style that you could use is like the build your own, right? So you walk into Chipotle and they don't say, do you want one, two or 10? They say, uh, what, you know, do you want a bowl or a taco, right? Or a bowl or a burrito. And they say, what, what protein do you want? You want chicken or, or pork, right? Um, and pizza is sim similar like that, but with pizza, right? Where you can pick different toppings on your pizza, right? Any pizza shop kind of works that way. And so these are two different styles of menu. You can either give people some set options or you can give them more customization. But of course you can do something in between as well, right? You can say, well, you know what? I have three types of soups. You don't get to customize your soup, but your salad, you get to pick. So do you want romaine or arugula or spring mix? And what kind of protein do you want on there? And do you want egg or do you want um, something else on, the, on your salad? So you can mix these two, right? But these are the extremes of two different types of menu styles. And Peter's going to go into this more detail about the kind of sourcing of the ingredients and and how to think about ingredients and how to reuse them to kind of create your, your menu. So, you know, this is kind of an overview of either a list of items or build your own, but he's going to talk in more detail about why you might choose one style over the other. Absolutely. And um, we'll talk a little bit about sort of like, where, where do you start with the menu, right? Like, you, you know, every restaurant, restaurant needs a signature item. Every place has something that they're remembered for. You go um, and you remember that thing. It's like, 
it is the right you go to Fadley's and it's the crab cake that is their signature right and it's important to really think about about um, as you're building the menu, like what are you going to be known for, right? What's going to create some excitement around customer that amongst customers, and um, and how can you tell the story, right? It's not just about saying I would like to sell a lot of these, but it's saying this, you know, it really connects to who we are as a business. So I put this picture over here on the right of Krause's um, Krause's Light Fair, which is in in Lexington Market. And they'll be in the new market and they do one thing and they do it really, really well. And that thing is turkey and it's turkey sandwiches. And they put so much focus on it that, I mean, look, you could roast turkey in the back and you could slice turkey in the back. It could be sitting in the front and it would look like any other deli. But they want you to know that this turkey is special. It's fresh and it's, it's so fresh that it's only going to get cut when you order it. So they put that turkey not in the back, but they put it up in the front. And they have somebody slicing it as you order it and you get to watch it, right? So they took um, the story, right, which is the fresh turkey, and they put it right out in front of the customers and they made that their signature item, right? And that's how they built this menu. So it doesn't have to be exactly like this. It doesn't mean you have to make your item in front of customers, but it means telling a story around it, right? Maybe that's a smell. Maybe that's the presentation of it. Um, maybe that's um, the way it's highlighted physically on the menu, right? You'll see like you go into a diner maybe and there'll be a hundred items on the menu, but there's a box around something. What is the box around, right? It's around like the pancakes and eggs. It's the breakfast special. Um, there's a reason why it's their signature. Um, so that's something Peter, to think I about at the beginning while you're building. I wanted to highlight that concept that you said, right? Of kind of the story that goes along with it and trying to bring it up front that's the public in public markets, right? That's what makes this different from a restaurant where you kind of come in and you sit down, you socialize and you kind of eat over food, right? Like you're coming to a public market, not only just for the food, but for the experience, right? And like you only have a few seconds, a couple of minutes to kind of catch someone's attention and you're constantly communicating that story as well. Absolutely. Um, so on the flip side, let's talk a little bit about what to avoid, right? Because you could put anything in the world on the menu, but there's some things that might look good and sound good, but they'll cause you problems for your business later on. So the first thing we'll talk about is, is cooking processes, right? Um, look, if you're in your, in your home kitchen, you know, you could take a couple hours, do one process, do another process, but in a restaurant, in a market stall, you need to reduce your cooking processes, right? To as few as you need to execute as delicious of a menu as you can, right? So here's an example. We'll go back to our Acme sandwiches, not well named, but I'm telling you, the sandwiches are going to be good. So look, the, if you're making deli sandwiches, right? Everybody's made a sandwich. What are you putting on it? You're going to put turkey, you're going to put cheese, you're going to put lettuce, tomato, put mayo, pickle, whatever it is you want, right? And if you make a roast beef sandwich, it's pretty much the same process. Bread, meat, vegetables, spreads, close it up, serve it, right? That process, regardless of what deli meat you put in those deli sandwiches, is going to be about the same. But what if I had a menu with these four sandwiches here? Fried chicken sandwich, a panini, a breakfast sandwich, and a grilled cheese. Well, the fried chicken sandwich, when somebody orders that, the chicken needs to be dropped, it needs to be taken out, it needs to be sliced, it needs to go in the sandwich. The panini needs a few items, then it needs to go into the press, closed, needs to wait for two minutes, and then it comes out. A breakfast sandwich, I need a pan for that, so that's got to be at the stove. You got to toast the, toast the bread and then put the whole thing together. And the grilled cheese, well, that's got to go open into the toaster, and then I have to take it out and put it together and cut it. So four sandwiches, four different cooking processes. These aren't gonna work super well because you might need a separate person to focus on these different areas or whoever's doing the breakfast sandwich is gonna forget that they have the panini. In. And so you gotta reduce these to as few processes as you possibly can. Um, and, and Peter, you can't make a grilled cheese in, in the toaster thing. You gotta make that on a grill. So I'm sorry, I can't let you slide on that one. Like you gotta well, grill. You know, what? Uh, you, know, you know what, that might be grandma style, but you know what they do at Subway? It goes in the turbo shaft. <laughs> Um, but you're right. Look, there's a million ways to make grilled cheese. And if you make your, if you figure out a way to make your a delicious grilled cheese with a similar process to something else, then you might be able to, um, you know, to have a more successful business to reduce labor costs, have fewer people in your stall at the same time. Right. So it's all engineering. Um, despite what grandma says, it's all engineering. Um, <laughs> um, but what else, right. It's like, it might not be 
just these cooking processes, but you could have too much labor going on in your stall in general, right? Um, it might be that um, you might have some items that require too much prep, right? You have a burger that also requires um, sauteed onions and you got to caramelize those onions for 30 minutes first thing in the morning and you got red peppers that need to be roasted and skinned and you got you, too many things, right? So how can you design a menu where maybe you have to source those things? like a pre-roasted, pre-skinned red pepper instead of doing it in-house, right? You're going to make decisions about what's the most important for the quality and where you can, you know, make compromises in order to um, get the best, in, in order to get the best process and the best quality product out there. Um, something that needs a unique skill set, right? If you can't train, cross-train um, this a skill to everyone, then you're going to need somebody that's dedicated just to that. So make sure that you don't have too many unique skill sets that are needed, or it could happen at once and be done and perhaps packaged into something else so that it could, anyone could use it later on. Um, items that don't keep, right? You know, any items that are going to be pre-prepped or an ingredient that's not going to last very long, like an avocado, right? You got to be careful with those items. It doesn't mean don't use them, but be conscious that that might cost you more in waste. You can't use too many items that don't keep well, or even uh, prepped items that don't stay longer. Um, and uh, the last thing is something that require, needs to be cooked in really small batches, right? Um, you might, you might, you not be able, if you get a rush and every single, uh, you have one pan for a burger and every burger's got to go in that pan because you got too many other items, then that's not going to work because you're going to get a backup, right? Or, or something needs to be dropped in its own fryer basket. That's not going to work. All right. So we'll talk a little bit here about ingredients. Al, good call. Cross utilization. That's a very important concept, right? But what does that mean? Um, when you're thinking about your menu, you're going to break it down into ingredients, right? All the components that go into each menu item. And the first thing you're going to want to do is, is take the most important items that you got, right? look at the ingredients that go into there and say, well, how can I use these items in as many different recipes as possible? Because that means you're going to have fresher ingredients because you're going to order them more often. It means that you're going to save money because you're ordering larger amounts of those ingredients and you're going to save on storage space, right? Because you don't need to have um, so, so much of that hanging, that hanging around. Um, availability, right? If you design a salad with a vegan feta cheese that's only available from one place in Greece, um, you might have issues. It might get expensive. The price goes up. You might have a hard time finding it. So making sure you have backups um, for the products that you put in is important. Um, and the last one is costing, right? Reusing items is going to help you with costing, but also just thinking about costing in general um, is, is going to help, right? Like there's lots of things you can substitute um, different ways you can make a recipe to get cost down without sacrificing the quality of that product. So I put this mac and cheese here because Pickett has an example related to mac and cheese. Oh, oh, yeah. Peter, Peter, I, I got to say this and I harp on this. It's a reason why you cannot find your grandma mac and cheese at a restaurant. Because <laughs> it is impossible for a restaurant to make your grandma mac and cheese. You know why? Because your grandma mac and cheese got six different types of cheeses in it and it, it and your grandma mac and cheese has 16 unique steps that she does that takes her all day to prep <laughs> that and prepare it and if you did that and sold it in a restaurant it would be $30 per scoop of mac and cheese so that's why you don't find that but you still can make a good quality mac and cheese but you got to think about um, the ingredients the steps the time the costing and Michelle, I know you feel me on this because you felt me about the real cheese. So I know you feel me on the on, on the mac on the, on the mac and cheese. So. <laughs> yes, that's a great example, right? There's all different types of cheese blends that you can use. You can use different toppings, right? And all you know, you may be going for one flavor, one thing. What's not non-negotiable about this? Like I have to have gouda because my grandma uses gouda. I don't know. Um, well, you use that, but then what else can you compromise on? Where can you get the cost to a reasonable place? Because you know what? It's the world's best mac and cheese, but nobody's going to buy it for 20 bucks, right? So those are um, some of the things to think about when it comes to ingredients. And thank you, Pickett. Um, something for everyone. Look, 
at the end of the day, this is a market stall, right? It's not a diner that's got a hundred items on the restaurant. So you're not gonna satisfy everyone, which is okay, right? It's okay because there's someone else next to you that's selling something different. There's somebody else doing a different cuisine, but there's some ways to think about making sure that you have a restaurant that's attractive to as many people as possible with the existing items that you have. So one is what can you do that's vegetarian and vegan, right? There's a lot of folks for health reasons, for uh, other reasons, like they, they don't eat meat, right? So well, how can you uh, capture those customers by highlighting the fact that you have some of these items on your menu, right? Sometimes people you will use a V, right, to indicate that. Um, sometimes it'll be like a little section of the menu. Um, same thing with, with gluten allergies, right? You can, uh, it's very easy to substitute flours and breads and different ingredients these days and, and to let people know that you have these options available. And maybe you're really close, um, your taco shop, and you're really close to being totally gluten-free. You only have like flour tortillas in one item. Well, maybe consider, you know, not using those flour tortillas because then you would be able to say that the whole kitchen's gluten-free. For some folks, that's important. For other folks, they're just looking for the item, but other folks, they want to see the whole kitchen. The same concept goes for nuts and allergens. Um, if you're going for a kosher certification, um, that's, you know, important too. All these things are important to let folks know about. Um, and then the last one, and this is, and this is important, right, is kids and parents, because when parents walk around the market, they're thinking a little bit differently than everyone else, right? They're looking for something that's just for their kid, right? Where their kid is going to be excited by that item. Doesn't mean it has to be chicken tenders, but chicken tenders are good. Um, it, it's looking for something that's a little more exp less expensive with a smaller portion, right? And it's, a, and it's more affordable, right? So that might mean you're taking something that you have already and just serving like a half portion, right? Or you're serving it just a little bit more plain, right? It doesn't have like the spicy sauce. It's just like the chicken and rice, right? So those are ways to just catch parents' attention. And when you get the kids, a lot of times you get the parents too. Is that right, Pickett? You have kids. I'll I'll make it up. <laughs> I have a 11-year-old and a 6-year-old uh, and, and we're out looking for food, right? They they factor into the options like what can the kids get and you like and like you said sometimes it's just a smaller portion or some kind of shift or something different but I know I I will choose a place right that has a kids option over some other place that doesn't if they're kind of in equal like I can go either way whoever has the kids option I'm gonna kind of go with them absolutely sometimes I look for kids options on the menu you know sometimes they're bad um. But uh, a couple a couple of things. So, you know, we've gone through a lot, but I wanted to hit a few keys for your menu, right? Um, these are things that are just small changes that can result in a pretty significant sales bump, right? So um, we, we talked a little bit about the size of the menu, but I just want to emphasize it one more time, right? Going from a menu that is 20 items to 10 items saves you in so many ways. It saves you time in the labor that you have in your kitchen. It saves you in the number of ingredients that you have to buy, the amount of storage space that you need dry, cold, um, the amount of times you have to go get more ingredients from the fridge or from downstairs from your storage, right? And it makes it easier for customers to understand your menu. Nobody likes to stand there and look through a menu that's 20 or 30 items long, especially in a market, right? They want to know, hey, this is the hamburger spot. This is the taco spot. This is the amazing salad spot. Um, and that's what I'm going to get. You know, yes, uh, maybe there's different types of salads, different meats on your tacos, but you don't have to go too crazy thinking that it's going to be a big revenue benefit, right? It's not. Um, using names and description, right? You can get creative with stuff. Hey, look, if it's your grandma's recipe, tell me it's your grandma's recipe. If it's, uh, even if you change it a little bit, okay, pick it. Um, if it's yeah, the, it, uh, it, ain't your, it ain't really your grandma's recipe. She might like <laughs> taught you how to make it. <laughs> that, and that's okay. <laughs> right, and, and if you are use if you're gonna use local ingredients for something, tell us about that, right? If it's a full, fully vegan item, tell us that, right? Using these descriptions, um, using the, the culinary terms and even the non-culinary terms like, hey, it's the world's best, you know, or it's my so-and-so's favorite, you know? These are fun things. There's culinary things and there's non-culinary things, but there's ways to describe things that just get you excited, get the customer to think, look, to take a second look at that item. Um, and it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's an opportunity to, to kind of connect to your story as, as well, right? 
when you think about concept and story and having that at the front, the menu item, you know, is a description is an opportunity to do that. You don't want to go overboard, but it's, it's an opportunity to connect it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then a couple kind of financial ones too, right? Um, one is varying your price points. So what that means is you're always going to have your kind of mid to your, your most sold items kind of in the middle of your menu in the, in the middle price point section, right? But it's important to have something that's a, like a little bit more too, something that's like that splurge item, something that's like a little bit, um, maybe a little harder to get a little bit more of a special occasion item. Why? Uh, because it actually helps you sell more of the items in the middle. People see the more expensive items and they th might think to themselves, hey, I don't need that today but I'm actually more likely to buy the item that's priced below it in the middle category as a result of seeing that high priced item. It, it connotes a little quality, um, but it's also a technique, it's, it's anchoring, right? It's anchoring by saying, well, I could buy this more expensive thing, but I'm actually gonna buy the mid price thing. And then likewise, it's also important to have some less expensive things on your menu. Perhaps their sides, their half portions, their sandwiches, things that you sell a lot of, uh, but maybe it's a smaller portion. Um, and those are there because, look, some people are going to come up to your stall and they're going to have a set amount that they want to spend. Maybe it's six dollars. And if you don't have anything in that in that lower tier category, you're just going to miss them. Right. You're going to miss the opportunity to sell them something today, hoping that they love it. And maybe they come back tomorrow and they've got more money to spend. Right. Or they're they're open. They're looking for a bigger meal that day. Right. So it's important to hit those different price categories. And the last, if you've ever been to a fast food restaurant, know this, is that combos increase sales, right? It means that you can sell additional items to folks um, that may just be coming to get a sandwich, but you say, hey, look, if chips and a drink is another two bucks. And they'd be like, you know what? That sounds like a deal to me. I'm in, right? It increases your ticket average um, and it helps you sell more. Um, so combos are sure, an important tool. I to uh, vary your price points. Um, and you can find this in the info session that we do for um, Lexi to Market. There's a set of guiding principles created by the community that they have for the vision for the market. And part of it is a variety of products at affordable price points. So, and the way that we get to that is price points that meet folks at various socioeconomic levels. So you want to have, you know, the, we're going to collectively, the market is going to have varying price points. So that's, that's definitely going to be a feature of the market. And if you can use that variety in price points to help you and your business, then definitely consider that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then kind of coming to the end here, but planning for changes, right? Um, no menu should be the same for 30 years, right? Um, great restaurants um, are, know how to use seasonality to um, put items on the menu that are at the peak quality. So it could be like this, right? It's a corn, a corn bowl for the summer um, when your corn's gonna be both most delicious and also least expensive, right? That's why restaurants use seasonal bowls and it gives something new to talk about, right? Something to market, to put on Instagram, to put in an email, put on your website and let folks know, hey, you know, look, we're, we're changing and we have this thing, it's at the peak of freshness. Um, and, but there's another reason to, to think about new items too. And they don't always have to be seasonal. It could be something that you're working on and you're not ready to launch or um, you're gonna launch at a certain time. Um, and what restaurants do with these is look, we all know that food costs continue to rise. Like they never go down, they always continue to go up. And there's only so many times you, can, you can't raise your prices every week, right? Um, even though the price of limes might go up a little bit every week. So. What restaurants can do is they'll use new items to get a better, uh, higher margin item, a lower cost item onto their menu and to start shifting sales to those new items as they bring them on, right? And it means that you can keep pace with the rising food costs without um, having to raise your menu prices across the board, right? It's a, it's a little bit of a trick that, um, that restaurants can use. So, so new items are not just exciting to customers, but they're also a financial tool to keep you successful. Um, and the last is uh, not being afraid to take off items that are not selling, right? Um, I read an article yesterday and it was from a little while ago, but Taco Bell, who doesn't have a big menu, they had eliminated 12 items on their menu, 12, that's huge. And people were pissed, but like for a day, 
And then they forgot about it and they kept going back to Taco Bell, right? And the point was there weren't really that many people buying them. They were buying ingredients they didn't need um, and they were confusing folks in the process. They could have a more streamlined menu with few, fewer options. So don't be afraid to take off poor selling items from your menu. And Peter, I wanna um, kind of go to a couple of questions that we have. And I know we're gonna have to shift to talk about stall layout and design. And so um, we, we did have um, two questions come in, one from Amber and one from, from Alan. Amber wanted to know, will there be service elevators? And I think that's a, a, a yes, there'll be elevators both for vendors and um, for um, patrons as well. And you'll kind of get into some of the, the layout. And then Alan asked, could he have an oven to bake bagels? And I think that answer is yes, Peter, but we're gonna get to it in the floor layout and the yeah. types of equipment and what'll fit in into a stall or not. And then Alan threw this one out here. He's like, will Bailey Seafood be in Lexington Market? And, um, and I will tell you, Alan, like a, one of the things that people love about Lexington Market are those vendors that have been there forever. And I think bailey has been there for like a hundred years, almost. I don't know if it's that long, but it's been a long time in Lexington Market. And um, they, they're definitely interested in being in Lexington Market. And we have um, communicated with them. Peter, I don't think anything's set for an announcement yet, but hopefully pretty soon we'll, we'll know. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any announcements just yet. Um, but, you know, like Pickett said, it's really important that the experience of Lexington Market has some continuity, right? Um, and that folks that you um, love, people that, um, you know, have loved over the years are still there. So um, I think there's a good chance they'll, they'll make it in the new market. Um, so and Peter, we, Peter yeah. I want to do a chat today because we got about, about 16, 17 minutes. I wanna make sure that we do get to the menu and the style design and layout so folks can see that and ask questions as well. Absolutely. So we're gonna jump into that. I wanna share one last thing real quick. And this is a menu from a restaurant that I'll admit to personally loving, but at the end of the day, they do a lot of the things that we've described here. So I'm gonna go through them real quick and then we're gonna jump into the design. And that restaurant is Taco Bell. So if you wait, think- Wait, wait, Peter, Peter, yes. you, 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 you use it at Taco Bell menu really i'm using taco all right Bell. Go ahead. Look, I'm gonna give you a here's the deal, here's you the deal. these guys these fast food chains they have it down you can debate the quality of the food but at the end of the day they know how to design the menu for you to get excited for you to spend money right and so what is it that they're doing here they have signature items they have a favorite section right they have beautiful pictures that attract you right under favorites, what do they have? Tacos and burritos. It's, it's the bread and butter of Taco Bell, right? They're selling a lot of these and they're making good money on them. Um, there's ingredient reuse. I mean, hello, every single item has taco shells. It's got shredded chicken. It's got ground beef. It's got cut up tomatoes. It's got sour cream, right? Like that's all it is, right? So they've really reused the items super well. Um, and there's something for everyone, right? If I got a big family, I got party packs. If I'm on a budget, cravings value menu. If I want something vegetarian, vegetarian favorites. Combos, they're increasing the, the, um, the, the, tickets, the ticket averages. So people aren't just buying like one, $2 tacos, right? They're saying like, I'm gonna get number three, the burrito supreme, and I'm gonna buy, get a, an extra taco and a drink, but I might not have ordered the burrito plus a taco, but here it is in the combo, right? And the last one is new items. It's like what maybe maybe six ingredients here that's combined that's <laughs> in right. multiple ways, and it meets multiple people's needs. Whether you need more of it or less of it or different combinations of it, but it's the same six ingredients. But tell me, what what is toasted cheddar? That's just like cheese that's toasted. Like what? I, what is I have that? no idea what toasted cheddar is, but you know what? My eye looked at that item first. It looked at it first because it looked exciting and it said new, right? So I looked at that and look, you got to believe that they had cheddar and a toaster and Taco Bell before they put this on the menu, right? They reuse things that they had. So look, you might be going through Taco Bell thinking you're getting delicious meal. And the reality is they are inside your brain as a customer. They're thinking from a customer's perspective, right? And that's why this is a genius yet simple menu. Cool. All right. You convinced me. That was a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. Here we All go. <laughs> We're going to switch over to the stall design at Lexington Market. So a couple of things to keep in mind here 
Um, this is this process is specific to if you were accepted as a vendor in Lexington Market, what would the next steps of the process look like for you to design your stall, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the walls and the fixtures and things like that. And um, if you if you end up in another place that's not Lexington, you know the process is going to be similar. Um, you'll have the same kinds of things to talk about, but it might not work exactly in this order. Uh, but hopefully this helps clarify for folks wondering like, hey, uh, how will like what will I do next? Like, do I have to come with a design? Do I have to know this? Um, or even for the application, which is going to ask you, what kind of kitchen equipment do you need in your stall, right? How do you answer that question? We're going to talk a little bit about that in this section. So give me one second. I'm going to switch to the other presentation and we'll get started. And Peter, why, why are you doing that? I want to remind folks, um, if you're on Zoom, you can use the question to ask, answer section or the chat section. And also if you're on Facebook Live, drop your questions in the comment box as well. We'll be checking those and, um, and giving you feedback as well. I'm checking the Q&A box. Um, and I think, let me see, I think we have one other question come in, Peter. Um, oh, Dina's giving us props. She said, great presentation. Thank you a lot, Dina. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Thank you, Pickett. So um, first we're gonna talk about sort of what comes with your stall, right? Um, if you've been in Lexington Market, you've looked at them, right? There are it can be a little different than what you might have seen, but, but pretty similar, right? So it's going to be a little different if you're a fresh food or you're a specialty vendor, which we talked about earlier, versus if you're a prepared food. But there's a lot of overlap, right? Regardless, you're going to have a, a stall that's going to have a floor. You're going to have walls. You're going to have. Um, I'm going to I'm going to jump here to to sort of like a example, right? A blank stall over on the right, but the, the landlord's going to provide a few things for you that you'll need as a, as a, as a cooking tenant. Um, it sinks, right? A hand sink, a prep sink, a three compartment sink. Um, and then in addition, there's some of the stuff that's kind of in the, in the background, right? Like your electrical panel, you need, you might need a gas hookup, uh, for cooking, um, gas, um, and, um, uh, like sprinkler system, fire alarm, right? These are built into the building. You don't have to worry about them, but they're there, right? And they don't cost you anything. Um, and the one thing that distinguishes a prepared food stall of what you get versus a fresh food stall is the cooking hood, the exhaust hood, right? And so that exhaust hood is up to an eight foot hood. It can go anywhere you want in the stall. We'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, it can go anywhere in the stall, um, depending on how you want to do it, right? You might want to put it up in the front so folks could see that cooking. You might want to put it in the back just to hide something that's not quite as sexy. I really want to show my display food up in the front, right? Like a steam table or something. Um, there's different ways to do it, and it's not set in stone yet. Um, so the next question is, well, but like, how do I determine where all this stuff goes, right? This is just a blank stall. I can see it's 17 feet, 17 feet. Um, and then what? Um, so we have a design team that's been working for the last year um, to design the building itself. And they're gonna continue to work with each of the tenants to design their individual stalls. Um, Brown, Craig, Turner, the design, their design group, they're the architects, we've got engineers. And we also have on the right side, Savoy Brown, who are food service designers. So they're experts in kitchen equipment, whether you're doing a flower shop, whether you're doing, um, a candy stall, whether you're doing a soul food restaurant, they are experts in the, um, the, the equipment that goes in it. So they'll help you lay it out, say like, hey, look, I'm trying to, um, you know, I want to do like, um, a, I want like a plancha to make like grilled pork, you know, okay, well, here's your options, right? And here's how you could lay it out. You could do a bigger one, smaller one, high, high heat one, a simpler one, whatever it is. So these folks are here to help you and it's at our cost as the project. You don't have to pay to work with them. Um, they'll do a couple iterations and take your questions and comments and let you drive the process. And if you're not in Lexington, it would be the same. You might hire um, all three groups or you might hire one person that's able to do a few of these things. Um, process would be similar, but we have 55 tenants that all need designs. So we need a lot of help. Um, uh, Peter, I just dropped into the chat box too. If you go to transformlexington.com, uh, you click on the opportunities page, I believe, and you scroll down, you'll see floor layout and market rent. So it shows you lots of different configurations based on the category of fresh food, prepared food, you, um, you know, specialty retail. You can see all that. 
And if you scroll down to market rent and you click on the little link at the bottom of that section, it actually prints out like a PDF that gives you the price per square foot. So you get a sense of how much the stall will cost depending on the size and the layout and the square footage. That's right. That's right. It shows some of those, um, those rental rates. Um, so jumping back into this slide here, right? When you sit down with the architects, um, there's a few steps that you'll go through, right? First, they're gonna ask you some, they gotta get up to speed on what your concept is, on what the restaurant is, what you're selling, what kind of food, um, is it hot, is it cold? Are you cooking on site? Are you sourcing chicken breasts? Or are you uh, breaking down whole chickens and turkeys, right? They'll meet with you and have that conversation. And then they're gonna, they're gonna take that information and, sorry, I missed one thing. And that is, there, you'll also talk about kind of what you want this stall to feel like, right? What's the story behind it? Are you a country kitchen and you wanna have some rustic wood and you wanna have some pipes holding up the menus, right? To kind of give it that like grandma's kitchen feel. Um, or do you want it to be more modern? You know, I'd like to use white tile. I'd like to use some steel, stainless steel countertops because that's kind of the, you know, I'm doing kind of like a modern Indian food, right? Um, and so they're gonna take that information and they're gonna put that into a layout and a design. Might look something like this. Right? These are example layouts um, that you know, just show you where that cooking hood might go, where those sinks might go, um, where the display and the counter, um, maybe even seating. You know, so you can have seating at the counter if you like. Um, and you know, maybe there'll be a wall or two within the stall that can help hide something that's kind of unsexy, like the three compartment sink, your, your pot washing sink, right? Nobody wants to see that. So there's a couple of ways to organize it, depending on what you want to showcase and depending on what you want to hide and depending on what the flow of the kitchen looks like, right? Because if you have, if you're making burgers all the way in the back and you got to, every single burger needs to be brought up to the front, you're going to waste a whole lot of staff time or your burgers aren't going to come quickly enough, right? So thinking through, you'll think through that with the design team and they'll put something like this together for you, um, which you'll then be able to review, make changes to, and they'll go back to, you'll go back to them. Um, and there's a couple decision, a couple more decisions that you'll make as well after like the layout and the kitchen equipment, right? This here, this is kind of like a rendering of the front of a stall, just an example. Um, and you can see you might have um, some, you, you'll definitely have some signage, right? So the design of the signage is part of their work as well. Um, you might have like number one, which is just like your main sign. You might have a number two, which is like a, a blade sign. So customers walking sideways, they can see that if they're not looking up at the main sign. Um, you might have some lights, you might have counters, tiles, um, mill work like things to display products right or or ingredients maybe you know ingredients that you use you could display up there um lots of different things that you could work into this and that you will talk with the designers about um pick it anything to add to that no i just love seeing this rendering because before we i think we only on the on site put 2d renderings where you can kind of see the floor layout and you're looking now I really like this one because you can kind of see, oh, this is the stall. This is me back there on the phone. <laughs> this is where customers are kind of stay. It, it kind of makes it feel a little more real. Uh, but I do like all the opportunities there to kind of um, design and reach customer. And I'm super excited that we're actually connecting folks with a whole design team. So you got the design expertise built in. You just got to communicate what you want. We have the design team to help you put it together and help you create it. That's right. And, and a question that folks might be thinking about at this moment is like, how does this get paid for? Like, who pays for this, right? And so here's what we, you know, we want you to understand is that um, the, the, those things we did, everything we've discussed up until now, right? The, um, the signage, the millwork, the lighting, your front counter, the tiles on the wall, everything that's fixed into the stall, the, the, the event hood, right? All of that, there's a budget for you to do. Each stall has its budget varies a little bit based on its size. Um, and the, and Peter, of, the, the money that somebody else is paying to do that, that we're paying, right? When you say budget. <laughs> right, exactly. The, yeah. pro, the project, we have money for you to do that work. You don't have to pay for it, right? Look, maybe you want to do something gold plated. You can spend money to do that. But um, the budget will cover this work that needs to happen in the stall, okay? 
What is not covered in that budget is the kitchen equipment, right? So as a restaurant, the equipment that you need that's unique to you, right? The stoves and the cooktops, the ovens, bagel oven, right? Um, Alan's bagel oven. Alan, you got to pay for that bagel oven. That's we right. Got you on a restaurant. You got to pay for that bagel oven. That's right. Yeah. Um, but hey, look, um, so, so that is, those items are the responsibility of the tenant to pay for, to bring, um, to procure for the project. And we do have um, sources of funding. We have an amazing like grant, or sorry, excuse me, a loan program, um, super low rates, um, that's just for vendors that are accepted into the market. So if you're worried about that, don't be too worried. Um, we um, have some information about it on our website, transformlexington.com. But you can apply to this program if you're an accepted vendor within the market to kind of get a loan that will help cover the gap. If you think you might, I'm not eligible to get a bank loan. Well, you will be eligible to get this loan. This is different. Um, and so that can help cover that gap. Um, or you might have business funds or... Um, you know, another way to fund it, whatever you want to do is fine. All right. So a couple other things you think about, right? Like these are kind of the things that are like in your court as a vendor, you're like here's what you are going to decide on and think about is part of this process. One is the materials, you know, what, uh, what is it that's going to make your stall stand out, right? We use the example of like a farmhouse kitchen. Maybe it's like a white tile with a black grout, right? That gives it that farmhouse kitchen feel. Maybe it's like some wood shelving. Um, you get to decide those things and you get to work with the team of designers and architects to, 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 make, uh, to make that call. Um, second is the equipment. We talked a little bit about that, but you know, you can use new equipment, you can use recent um, used equipment, but it has to be, uh, has to meet certifications, got to pass the health department, um, but you can kind of go either way on that. And regardless, um, you know, it's got to be right for what you need. You, get, you have to have what um, will work for your stall. And the third, and this can be part of your display and part of the story of the stall, right, is your products, right? We actually, and don't want the architects to design a stall that is attractive. We want the products to stand out on their own, right? So when you walk up to a stall in Lexington Market, like, in fact, if I asked you, Pickett, can you tell me the tile color at Krause's? Do you know what it is? I have absolutely no idea. I like, I, when I walk up, I, I'm not looking at, oh, this is a beautiful case. It's like, I yeah. like the glass the meal work on this case. I'm like, that sandwich looks delicious. That's I right. want to eat it. That's right. You see sandwiches being made. You see that turkey being carved, right? What happens when you walk up to Harbor Fish, right? Like, tell me, what's the baseboard in Harbor Fish? What, what, what's on the floor in there? I have no idea, but I no like idea. when I see those like, fish and the fish eyes, I was like, oh, are they staring at me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It goes right to the product. And you remember that fresh product and not so much like, hey, it just had like cool tiles. So, so that's important too, right? In the design is that you showcase what you want people to see and what you want them to remember. Um, there's a couple of things. Peter, I just want to recognize yes. we're, we're coming right up on our time of seven. And I know we have about four more slides to go through. And I'm, I'm committed to staying here. Um, I understand if some of our friends have to leave and go, but me and Peter are going to stay here a little while longer, go through the rest of these slides and answer some questions. This session is being recorded. So if you do have to jump off and go now, we definitely understand. But this will be on the transformlexington.com um, website. Um, so you can actually go back and look at all of it from the beginning to the end. So, Peter. Yes, absolutely. We will wrap up quickly. Thank you for the time check. Um, I want to mention a couple of things here that are in the market, but not in your stall, right? These are here for, to help you out. There's storage space, right? So there's dry storage, there's cold storage space. Um, there's an area for trash. Um, there's a compactors that all you'll be able to throw your trash into. It gets picked up. Um, don't really have to think about it, trash and recycling. Um, and then out in that same area, there's a, a loading dock on the, on the back side of the market. This customer's not going to see it. It's kind of covered so that you don't, um, you know, uh, it doesn't have that kind of bad look or the smell of the trash or whatever. It's all contained, uh, but it's important too, because you're gonna need a space for deliveries to come in. You need a space to drop off items that you need in your stall. 
um, there's bike racks and storage um, for bikes and things like that out there too, for, for, for trash and grease um, that your stall might create. So those are important, important parts of the market, but they're not inside your stall. And we get a little mention here of the outside of the market, right? Um, there's a few stalls that have outdoor takeout windows and there's an opportunity to put a little sign next to those takeout windows. Um, some kind of rules about that, but at the end of the day, the architects will guide you into making a really nice looking sign. If you are in one of those stalls, um, kind of facing the plaza in the outside of the market. And the last thing I'll talk about here is construction, right? So just like with design, we have an amazing construction team in Southway Builders who's been um, working on this project so far. And um, they will continue yeah, to do I just want to give a shout out to, um, you have a picture of Eric there. I want to give him a huge shout out for kind of leading the construction um, at Southway. He's doing an amazing job. Um, check out that time-lapse camera on yeah. transformlexus.com. Amazing construction team in Southway. Yes, they, 